The last quarter century have witnessed tremendous advances in our knowledge about how cancer cells become cancerous. The genetic alterations, the way the body uses its immune system to try to identify them, the way the cancer cells use blood vessel growth and shift their metabolism, and step by step, we're using this knowledge as ways to identify an Achilles heel in cancer cells so that we can develop new and better therapies that are not only more efficacious but have fewer side effects. And I'm pleased to say that we've got a really expert panel up here to talk to you about all these, all these latest advances. Now, it's, it's only because of the support and help that people like you have provided to the scientists and to Penn and the Abramson Cancer Center in particular that we've been able to make these kinds of advances. You know, through, through your donations, we're able to carry out research and attract the talent and, and put people together. So we're really very grateful to you for that. Uh, our research is also reviewed by scientists through what we call the peer review system, where scientists review the Cancer Center, they review our programs, our grants, they score us against everyone else in the country. And I'm pleased to say that the Abramson Cancer Center in its last review got as high a score as you can get in this kind of review, uh, not only for the breadth of programs, uh, but for the depth of the research and for the way the research is connected to the patient care uh, was particularly uh, called out. So we, we really are in a very special position, and I know you'll be excited to hear about some of the advances this evening. So it's my privilege to introduce the new uh, director of the Cancer Center, Chi Van Dang, who joined us this year he came from Johns Hopkins, where he had worked for over 12 years, uh, not only as a cancer scientist himself, trying to understand how cancer cells uh, change their metabolic pathways so that they can grow more quickly uh, and, and escape uh, some of the various ways that, that we would use to treat them. Uh, but he also uh, ran the, the whole research enterprise at, at Johns Hopkins at, at an administrative level, so tremendous breadth of experience and talent, and we're, we're privileged to have him join us uh, here at Penn. So, Chi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Larry. Uh, it's really delightful to be here tonight, and I'm very glad that uh, Penn Medicine Advances is featuring some of our best from the Abramson Cancer Center to talk to you tonight about preventing and curing cancer with the latest new tools of the trade. As you heard from uh, Dean Jameson, well, first of all, I'm not new director anymore. After about five months, you're, you're old, you know. Um, <laughs> and you also have to excuse me. I do have to read from my notes because I always remember when I go to the, the market and my wife would give me a list and if I don't bring it with me, I always come home without something. So I have to remind myself of a few things. In any case, you heard about this exceptional rating that we got from the National uh, Cancer Institute. And this recognition really came from a long history of a groundbreaking science that's been done at Penn, and a rich clinical expertise at Penn that brings together a phenomenal faculty with um, staff that are willing to get together in teams to solve uh, major challenges facing our, our patients. So innovative science, uh, translational medicine, and visionary administrators, and generous donors like yourself are key elements of our past and future successes. So your continued contributions will be critically important for our success in the future and also bringing new hopes for patients with devastating diseases that collectively we call cancer. Now the advances in prevention and treatment you'll hear tonight will be coming from our uh, outstanding panel and I'm going to introduce them and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lynn Schuchter to um, moderate the panel. Um, Dr. Lynn Schuchter is our Chief of Division of Hematology and Oncology and leader of our melanoma program. She's very well known for her translational work in, in melanoma. And um, she's also my boss, by the way, because I'm part of the hematology division. Um, and she came to Penn in 1989. And since then, she can speak to you in all of the tremendous changes at the Abramson Cancer Center, going from a cancer center that's coalesced a number of experts and now into an eminent national and local treasure that's underpinned by innovations in translational cancer care. Um, Dr. Stephen Brem, next to uh, Dr. Schuchter, is Chief of Neurological Oncology and Co-Director of Penn uh, Brain Tumor Center. 
He joined us uh, from the Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida, where he developed innovative techniques on, on minimally invasive surgery, in contrast to my daughter, who wants to do maximally invasive <laughs> surgery. Um, his research focuses on experimental therapeutics, genomics, and advanced neuroimaging. Dr. Stephen Hahn, next to uh, Dr. Brem, is chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology. He is uh, one of the pioneers in this field, has been a guiding force for one of Penn's uh, medicine's strongest assets being the largest and most comprehensive radiation oncology department. And also there's, with the addition of the Roberts Proton Therapy Center, uh, Dr. Um, Han is able to lead uh, one of the, a very unique set of skills to really bring new technologies to patients in advanced form of radiation therapy. Most importantly, he decided that when you come to Penn and get radi uh, proton therapy that you would be on a protocol. So we want to really commit ourselves to individualized cancer care driven by strong science. And Dr. John Kucharczyk, I'm sorry, uh, who's chief of division of uh, thoracic uh, surgery, is leading our team now to really form a team around thoracic uh, cancers, uh, bringing together all the uh, a whole group from basic scientists to translational scientists to outcomes researchers to really bring new levels of uh, uh, innovation to clinical care, translational research, and education. Then Dr. Uh, Robert von der Heide, known to me as Bob, uh, <laughs> is our Associate Director of Translational Research, and is one of the top young innovative investigators in the Cancer Center. And he's uh, one of the pioneers in cancer immunotherapy. You'll hear a little bit about that. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and is currently leading our efforts to bring science from the uh, bench into the clinic, providing new therapeutic approaches to pancreatic cancer, for example, and other devastating uh, cancers. So before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Schuchter to have the panel really tell us a little bit in a few minutes, there are a couple of housekeeping things I gotta tell you about, which is you're attending a series of uh, public uh, presentations by Penn Medicine, and there's also cards uh, on your seat that you can also write questions as you hear about this or submit it for the panel. And finally, there's a reception right after this so you can mix in with the panel and ask him some additional questions. So I'll turn on over to Dr. Schuchter to have the panel okay. tell us a little bit about their work. Thanks, Chi. I'd like to extend a welcome um, and thank you for having us uh, tonight. Um, I'm joined by a really remarkable panel, as, as Chi has mentioned, and it really represents, I think, the spirit of what we're trying to do at the Abramson Cancer Center, which is to combine disciplines and to combine new way of approaching therapy. So on the panel, you have a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, and two different types of surgeon, and they're really interested in different modalities of therapy, and I think that really highlights the kind of interdisciplinary collaborative research that we really um, cherish and nurture at the Abramson Cancer Center. What we want to do tonight is really provide an overview of some of the exciting opportunities in new research, and more importantly, an opportunity for you to ask us questions. What are burning questions that you have about new approaches to cancer diagnosis or treatment, even about prevention and screening? So we can try to handle topics that maybe are not quite in our area, and we have other expertise in the room as well to help us. So thank you, and we hope this is going to be an informative evening. Bob, why don't you start and share with us new approaches to immunotherapy? Okay, thanks, Lynn. It's a very exciting time in the field of immunotherapy for cancer, and that is manifest uh, by two new drugs approved by the Food and Drug Administration over the last two years, the first time such drugs have ever been approved. And one is for prostate cancer, one is for melanoma, and the melanoma drug is the first drug to actually extend, proven to extend survival, overall survival of patients with advanced melanoma. A couple of things about those, um, what those drugs represent. The first is that it took a lot of hard work, and the drugs are available now because of a lot of rigorous science that's been done over the last couple of decades. And the second point is that the drugs aren't perfect. We know we have a long way to go. And at Penn Medicine and at the Aberson Cancer Center, we are dedicated to the notion that the immune system can do something about cancer, and we're able to make drugs based on, on the immune system. And I think it's not a crazy notion to say that over the next five years, drugs that uh, motivate the immune system will become one of the fastest new class of drugs for cancer and we hope they hold the promise of fewer side effects than some of the other therapies that we have available right now. 
So I can speak uh, from the heart on these therapies. My laboratory is dedicated to this um, notion to find new immune therapies. And we asked the question um, many years ago whether or not pancreatic cancer could be uh, susceptible to the immune system. And when I, we started studying this tumor with the young investigators in my lab, we were impressed by this incredible shroud, this incredible denseness around pancreatic cancer that explains why it has been so difficult to treat and why there have been very few new therapies over the last 10 years. And we were just about to give up and everyone told us to give up <clears throat> until one of the young investigators asked me, why would this cancer go to such trouble to hide from the immune system if it didn't really have a reason to fear the immune system? And I thought that was a pretty good argument. About a year ago, we published a report of a new idea where we were able to activate the immune system in a way that we didn't imagine was possible. And the immune system invaded pancreatic cancer, both in uh, laboratory models that we had, but also in a clinical trial that was performed at Penn. And we found that the immune system was able to shrink away the tumor in a fraction of the patients. And what struck us was how it did that. We learned that the immune system was able to dissolve the stroma, the structure that the, that the cancer has built, a bit like knocking down a brick wall by eating away the mortar instead of always having to put our fist against the brick. This has given us uh, a notion, um, new ways to use the immune system, and we're building upon, building upon that now, new um, clinical trials going forward with this idea in pancreatic cancer. Okay, thanks, Bob. John? Great. Um, this year has been a relatively exciting year for people that are interested in the treatment of patients with um, lung cancer and uh, thoracic malignancies. Um, we built on some of what Bob has just spoken about uh, with immunotherapy. We completed two immunotherapy trials partnering with some industry sponsors. Um, and they use a strategy where we give an antigen that's highly expressed on the patient's tumor um, and give them an immunomodulatory molecule at the same time to try to stimulate their immune system. And they go through a vaccine-like protocol. So we completed a phase three trial in that, and we're waiting for those um, uh, results to mature. Um, the problem with that initial trial was that the expression of those particular proteins are relatively low. They only present a small number of lung cancer cells. Um, so we just completed a phase one trial with the same company using a, a more widely expressed antigen. Um, and so we've shown that that has been safe, and now as soon as those results mature, then we'll move on to a treatment study. Um, we've also made a number of advances uh, through our colleagues in radiology at Penn Medicine. Many of you may have heard on the news or in a lot of the popular newspapers about the lung cancer screening trials. Um, and that's looking at screening former smokers and active smokers uh, between the ages of 45 and 70 uh, with low-dose CT scans. And that trial, the results were amazing. It showed an overall 20% reduction uh, in mortality rates. And so we've incorporated in that into our practice. Um, the final thing which is specific to us as a group at Penn, um, and she alluded to this, is that we've spent the past year reorganizing ourselves, realizing that we have been the stewards of a huge amount of resources, um, and maybe in the past we didn't organize them in a way in which they were really delivered to our patients in the most friendly, convenient, efficient, and effective way. Um, so we've spent the past year reorganizing ourselves from the basic scientists who study lung cancer to the translational scientists like Bob who come up with new treatment algorithms, um, to myself as the clinical surgeons, pulmonologists, clinical caregivers. Um, we've got nurse navigators who help our patients navigate through our big health system. And finally, we've included some of our outcomes uh, researchers to try to look at what the outcomes of what we do are. And we've really tried to incorporate a more holistic approach. Um, I kind of learned from my grandmother. You know, my grandmother, she's long gone now, but she wasn't interested in five-year survivals or cure rates. What she really wanted to know is a month after she got out of the hospital, where was she going to be? Was she going to be at home with her husband, with her grandchildren, or was she going to be in a nursing home? So although we have maintained our scientific focus, we've taken some more humanistic outcomes and are starting to try to look at those as well. John, can I just ask you to clarify? So the, the, the data and the information about screening for mm -hmm. lung cancer was, was controversial. What is your recommendation for screening for lung cancer? What is the role of CT scan? Who should be screened? So, um, well, the initial criteria for the study were uh, active or former smokers between the ages of 45 and 70. Um, and it's low-dose CT scans. You get your first scan at the baseline time point. If that's negative, um, you get two additional Normal. scans separated a year apart. 
Um, and so, you know, my basic philosophy is to screen all spokers that come our way. We did part of our reorganization this year was to set up a lung nodule clinic uh, with the pulmonary medicine folks, um, and that's basically the algorithm they follow. Okay, thank you. Steve. So um, <clears throat> this is also a really uh, exciting and, and uh, very vigorous time in uh, the radiation biology imaging program in the Abramson Cancer Center. and. Uh, of course, many of you have uh, heard of the discussion going on in the newspapers about proton therapy, and all of our therapies in radiation uh, within the Abramson Cancer Center are really designed to maximize the effect on the tumor and try to increase cure rates with radiation and minimize the effects on normal tissue so we have less side effects. Um, and so our proton therapy program, research program at Penn, is really dedicated to, to trying to figure out how we can maximize that effect on the tumor and reduce the effect on normal tissues. And so um, while we have a healthy debate about the role of proton therapy in the treatment of cancer patients, we at Penn Medicine are actually enrolling our patients on clinical trials. And to date, we've treated over 600 patients with proton therapy, and I'm very proud to say that every one of them has been enrolled in a clinical trial where we will look at the outcome of patients and ask a question about either its effectiveness or the side effects. And I think we're dedicated to sort of proving to the community one way or the other the best role for this novel uh, radiation treatment uh, for cancer patients. A couple other things that I wanted to mention, one of the great things of being at Penn Medicine is the collaborative nature. Um, and we have a number of uh, clinical trials within this program which uh, highlight that. One is. Uh, the emerging use of radiation in its various forms with immunotherapy. And we have a protocol that actually Lynn and Bob are involved in where we're using radiation as a vaccine. Um, so kind of an interesting approach. I think someone has uh, taken the name Radvax for that, right, Bob, uh, for, for this approach. But very exciting. Um, it's in melanoma patients, and I think that this will prove to be a very interesting approach going forward. And then the last thing, we um, are also dedicated um, in radiation oncology to being able to individualize treatment in such a way that when you come to see us, we'll be able at some time in the future to be able to draw a, blood, a tube of blood or look at your tumor and actually predict who should have radiation therapy, who might get side effects from radiation therapy. And we currently have a, a registry trial of over 1,200 patients treated at Penn where we've collected samples uh, blood, urine, and tumor samples in these patients. And we're specifically asking these questions about what will predict your outcome and your side effects. So this is really hard research to, to get funded because it's what we call discovery research. But it's really important because you want whoever comes through the door, grandkids, kids, in the next 20 to 30 years, hopefully later, or hopefully never, uh, you want them to be able to ask their doctor, is this the right treatment for us, for me? And so this is the sort of research that we're doing to kind of answer those questions. Steve, can I just ask you to clarify proton therapy versus regular radiation therapy? Yeah, so proton therapy um, is uh, a type of particle therapy. Um, it's uh, uh, yeah, delivered via a, what's called an accelerator. And when we spin these protons around very quickly, and it basically allows us to, um, to push these protons into patients at a specific depth. And the bottom line with protons compared to regular radiation is that there's less dose to the surrounding normal tissues from protons for any given amount that you give to the tumor. So we call that integral dose, but the bottom line is the normal tissues tend to get less dose from protons than they do from, from regular x-rays. And the real question, Lynn, as you know, is does that benefit patients? Um, and those are the questions that we're trying to answer. Great. Thank you. Dr. Brown. That's exciting. Uh, Steve doesn't know it, but we discovered a new particle. It's called the broton. This is um, when uh, brothers. Um, the city of brotherly love in Philadelphia, when, when mines come against mines and, and when they stimulate one and set off a charge, and that's what collaboration is, it sets off a form of energy. So it's just Protons. exciting to listen to you guys and getting all kinds of ideas. Or cistrons. Cistrons, yes. Cistrons. That's it, that's it. I, yeah, I want to be politically correct. Um, I'm excited to talk about the uh, brain tumor program, and uh, I'm not a cardiologist, but I will speak from the heart. And I did want to acknowledge that um, we have a family here, the Brave family. I think you're hiding in the back. And um, what our mission is, is to go from discovery to recovery and to build a circle of exceptional care around the patients. And uh, given the tools here at Penn Medicine, I was able this morning to remove a uh, tumor deep in the language area on a young teacher from Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, Patricia is able to go back 
and teach your fourth grade class because of the tools that we have. Um, based on very, very advanced imaging, we are able to see what formerly was invisible. We're able to see the language pathways. So I'm so grateful to be at, at uh, Penn Medicine. But we know working at, and having removed um, hundreds if not thousands of brain tumors, we know that the ultimate answer is going to be in the area of uh, Dr. Chi Dang's research in metabolomics and genomics. And about 10 years ago, as you know, the human genome was deciphered. And a few years ago, the cancer genome was deciphered, and it was first in uh, brain tumors. And the vision of our group, uh, and we have about 24 scientists and physicians working together now in 10 departments and six Penn institutions interested in solving and, uh, the problem of brain tumors, and it's a formidable one, but I think with the um, gene mapping and the brain mapping, if we can combine the two, we really will make great headway. There are just literally hundreds of drugs out there and many combinations, and I really look forward to the day when, um, I mean, I love the Cancer Center, but I really look forward to the day when uh, we're going to find the right combination somewhere on this table, and we're going to have to turn it into just another Penn dormitory. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I would just like to briefly uh, touch on a few topics related to melanoma. Um, the fact that my co-panel has mentioned melanoma is really surprising. Uh, this has been a disease that's been very, very difficult to treat. Can I just, a show of hands, who knows what melanoma is? Excellent. So melanoma is a type of skin cancer. It's the serious type of skin cancer. And until last year, there was really no effective therapy for this disease once it had traveled. So I'd just like to talk about three points tonight. One is about uh, prevention, one is about early detection, and then talk about uh, briefly new therapies. And I'll confine my time to three minutes or less. Um, I wanted to first talk about prevention and just mention that um, it's very clear that ultraviolet radiation is linked to melanoma and other skin cancers. And you're gonna see next month or the next two months that the new regulations for sunscreen are coming into effect. And we've handed out sunscreen tonight, um, and the labels are gonna be changing next month. And the labels for sunscreen are, need, are gonna need to be protection against UVA radiation and UVB radiation. Current sunscreen products when they label with SPF is really addressing just UVB radiation. But we now know that melanoma is linked to UVA and UVB radiation. So you're gonna see new labeling um, and wording about what the ingredients are, that it's not waterproof, that they're really water resistant. And for the first time this year, there's clear data that regular use of sunscreen products reduces the risk of melanoma. It's been clear that it reduces the risk of squamous cell and basal cell skin cancer, the non-serious form, but new to show that it actually reduces the risk of melanoma. Also, there's a lot of movement to change tanning parlors to, it is a device by the FDA, but growing evidence that clearly UVB radiation is carcinogen and that the epidemic of our daughters and grandchildren going to tanning salons is really an issue and clear link between tanning parlor use and risk of melanoma. In a recent survey, 25% of uh, college senior girls have gone to the tanning salon in the last year. So there's legislation in this state and others about parental consent, um, but that really hasn't done anything in terms of reducing the usage of tanning parlors and tanning salons. So if, if one message can get out tonight is really about the dangers of tanning salons and it's really appropriate to look pale and white and uh, have no sunburn. Um, so protect your skin, your skin, um, and our um, siblings and children's skin. There's also really cool new data that the, uh, the sun is addicting and that why do we like being in the sun? What is the drive? And really interesting data that there's an addicting quality to sun exposure. And from an evolutionary perspective, this really may be linked to um, in northern latitudes, um, you really do, everybody needs to get exposure of vitamin D. If you don't get vitamin D in childhood, you get rickets, which is um, you can't survive if you don't have vitamin D. Your bones don't form and other things. And in later adulthood, you need vitamin D. 
So what is the drive to leave the cold and the dark in the northern latitudes, latitudes to get out into the sun to get vitamin D? There's really interesting data that it may be linked to endorphins, the opiates, and, and linked to vitamin D production in the skin. And the, so the link between the addiction to sun and wanting to get out there, there may be a healthy reason that we all originally wanted to get out there, but now it's very easy to get vitamin D in our diet. So this is interesting data about why we seek sun, but also really compelling data about the dangers of sun and sun exposure. There's also really uh, interesting new data on devices to detect moles at a much earlier point. Moles are precursors to melanoma. And now new technology to aid the human eye and the dermatologists and their nurse practitioners to find melanomas, find these worrisome lesions that could lead to melanoma. And there's, at last count, we had a talk on um, Friday, 34 different apps on the iPhone to find moles, take pictures of moles, and send moles to either dermatologists or other ways to track a funny-looking mole that could be a precursor to melanoma. And let me just then um, end by talking about new therapies. So tonight you've heard about immunotherapy approach which is to rev up your, the immune system to tackle cancer and melanoma. So ipilimumab is this new medicine, we call it ipi, which takes the brakes off the immune system and allows for a full um, immune response and has been very helpful at treating patients with advanced melanoma. And at the same time, a new approach called targeted therapy, which all of us are interested in. And so that is understanding the genes that are broken in a cancer the mutation that's driving the cancer cells to grow, and to find then a personalized therapy or pill that targets that specific gene that's broken. And in melanoma, Penn and the Aperson Cancer Center was um, involved 10 years ago with the discovery of a gene called BRAF that is mutated or broken in about 50% of patients with melanoma. It's driving the melanoma cells to grow. And just last year, a pill called vemurafenib blocks that pathway, puts the brakes on, and is an unbelievably effective therapy for patients with melanoma. It's not curing patients with advanced melanoma, but in 25 years of me treating patients with advanced melanoma, I've never seen a therapy more effective. I mean, patients who are literally on oxygen and on pain medicine coming off within three days of these medications or oxygen because of this rapid response. Now, for all of these therapies, um, the BRAF-targeted therapy including, the cancer cells become resistant. They outsmart us, and they figure out ways to work around this break. So a lot of the research efforts that are ongoing now is to understand how do we prevent resistance, how do we combine therapies, how do we combine immunotherapy, radiation therapy, and targeted therapies to really, as Dr. Jamison mentioned, the Achilles heel of the cancer cell. So that's really the focus is how do we optimally select a patient for the right therapy that's tailored to that patient, selecting their tumor, doing extensive profiling, and then matching the right treatment at the right time for that patient. And we do think it's going to be a combination of effort of multiple disciplines to really achieve that kind of success. So I will end there with my comments, and we are now going to open up for questions. Some of you have um, provided questions already. Um, Trish, are we going to, should I start with some of the provided questions? Yep. There was one question for you, Dr. Bram, is that brain surgery sounds really scary and complicated. Can you tell us about what advances in terms of looking at um, less invasive ways or more minimally invasive ways to do brain surgery? All right. Well, all right. First of all, brain surgery is, is not rocket science. <laughs> um, it should not be scary, especially for the surgeon. It should also be not be scary for the patient, but it's not something that you would like Pay to you know it's not like joining the Marion Club. It's not something that you would choose to do. So what we're what we're choosing to do is um, we have really um, what I tell patients and the brave families here. It's not just the surgeon, but it's like do you remember the Verizon commercials where the guy would drive up and the network would be behind him. We have a very strong network at Penn Medicine 
a lot of anesthesia, a lot of critical care people, neural monitoring, so that it's possible to do maximal uh, safe removal of tumors and do targeted therapy by eradicating the tumor while preserving the brain. So I tell my patients that immediately um, calms them down is that I'm not really a brain surgeon, I'm a tumor surgeon. And uh, we have some very sophisticated imaging which really pinpoints, it's like a GPS that we use. And for years, um, we could see the surface of the brain and um, we could map out the critical areas to avoid. Now we have at Penn Medicine, we have a four-dimensional view. We can see functional areas. We can talk to patients while they're awake and preserve language function. We can see the language fibers. And this has really not been, um, I, I, this is really a new era. This is a, that word transformative, historic new era is, is used a lot. But this, we are really in a new, um, a new epic. So it's exciting, it's an exciting time and it makes it a lot safer for patients, many of whom are able to go home in a day or two intact. Bob, there's a lot of questions about immunotherapy. Okay. Yeah, can, I agree. <laughs> can you expand on some of the recent work that you and uh, Dr. June have been doing and just a, a better understanding of how do you rev up the immune system? How is this going to be effective treatment? Right. So that's a, it's a fantastic question. How do you turn on the uh, immune system? Uh, there's, there were two main problems facing us, and one was a, a biological problem, a physiological problem, and that is any time we form an immune response to a bacteria, to a virus, to a pathogen, our immune system is wired immediately to turn it off. When that doesn't happen, actually, that's a type of disease. Um, and so cancer understands that, and as soon as our body begins to form an immune reaction to cancer, it's, it uses all those same tricks and turns everything off. And what turned out to be a really surprising uh, notion is that rather than necessarily stepping on the gas and pushing harder on the immune system, what we needed to do is cut the brakes. So if you have a car at the top of a hill, you can step on the gas, and we do that, or you can make the car go by getting rid of the brakes. And that has turned out to be an amazingly um, uh, productive concept that has delivered already one new drug and many more coming. The other problem that we face is that when we are treating our patients with cancer, we recognize that their immune systems have been beaten up by a number of things, including the treatments that we give them, but also by the cancer itself, as I mentioned. And so an option is, rather than doing everything, asking the patient's immune system to do everything uh, on their own, is a way to um, get a blood sample from patients and take that to a clinical manufacturing laboratory, which we have one of the best at Penn, and to re-educate those lymphocytes in a way and replace all the deficits, make them targeted toward the tumor, and then put them back in. So what you end up with is this idea of a white blood cell transfusion, kind of like a red blood cell transfusion, except it's white blood cells. And we give them an address and say, you know, go to the cancer. This is the work that uh, Dr. Carl June has done. Um, uh, over the last uh, 10 years that resulted in this magnificent, magnificent breakthrough that was published about four months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, where he was able to do just that with a type of uh, leukemia called CLL with staggeringly amazing results. I has heard Carl present these data at a scientific meeting filled with jaded scientists, nothing is good enough, and you could hear them gasp when heard when they heard the data, I was sitting next to a person who was just like uh, stunned. We all are. And our eyes are now open to maybe we can take this type of technology, this type of cell-based therapy to other malignancies. And in fact, in pancreatic cancer and many other solid tumors, including melanoma, Lynn, we're designing ways to achieve uh, that type of uh, therapy in those tumors as well. And there was a specific question about immunotherapy in Hodgkin's disease and in prostate cancer. In Hodgkin's disease. Is there any, you want to just speak to? Well, prostate cancer, cancer is, uh, um, there's a, a, a vaccine, I mentioned it briefly in the introductory comments, a vaccine uh, for um, prostate cancer uh, that was approved by the FDA. And it was uh, approved for patients uh, who had an advanced form of prostate cancer. And it was proven 
in a properly designed clinical trial to extend the survival of patients on average uh, uh, of, and patients who got the vaccine who didn't. And that, that now is a drug that's available at many cancer centers, including Penn. And it uh, indicated that um, the important point about that is that it happened in prostate cancer. And for those of you or uh, those of us who've been in the field, we, we never thought it w that the breakthrough would happen in, in prostate cancer, which is uh, not a tumor that we understood to be, um, uh, catch much attention of the immune system. And the fact that it happened in that particular disease was very uh, surprising and um, al allowed us to think that immune therapy may, may be a very broad-based therapy and applicable across, across the board. Great. The, the questions are phenomenal. And um, hopefully we'll get to many. Steve, this question, it's not radiation therapy, but I think you'd be a, a good person to answer. This question about how does cancer spread and is cancer more than one disease? Could you just sort of speak to our understanding of that? Sure, sure. So um, cancer, um, you know, we've always categorized cancers based upon where they started. And um, we sort of talked about those diseases based upon uh, where the cancer started. And we can often predict, you know, predict where those cancers will spread when they do based upon where it started. So cancer I, I, is not one disease. There are a number of different types of cancers. And we are, we're starting to move away from the classification of cancers based upon where they started, although that's still how we do things, and moving more toward a genomic or a genetic classification of tumors. And there are specific abnormalities in the genes of cancers which will ultimately, we believe, help us predict how those cancers will behave, whether that's to spread or not to spread, or how they'll respond to treatments. And so uh, I think the answer just overall is that it's a number of different diseases is cancer. Um, and we're beginning to learn more and more about the underlying genetics of the cancer. And that's going to help us figure out the best way to treat those cancers. And the, the, uh, the point of early detection and with screening, either colonoscopy, mammography, skin exams, um, is to detect the cancer at its very earliest, when before it has spread. Um, and then we rely on our surgical colleagues to remove that cancer. And then understanding what is the prognosis of that cancer, what are the risks that it's going to travel to lymph nodes or to distant sites, and then making a decision on whether to give what we call adjuvant therapy or extra therapy after the surgery. So we look at a number of factors, both about, both about the patient themselves and about the risk factors in their cancer to decide if they need any extra therapy to prevent a recurrence. The, the concept is you're treating microscopic metastasis. And then after somebody's diagnosed with cancer, then a series of tests that are done to monitor uh, for a recurrence of cancer. And again, the surveillance or the monitoring varies depending upon the type of cancer and what the risk of recurrence is. Um, but it does matter in terms of the, the sophistication of the, of the uh, 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 imaging uh, to know how to best do the surveillance and incorporate that information to an overall plan. But so the idea is really early detection is the key to sort of minimizing the extra therapy that somebody might need and for long-term cure. Do you want to comment on surgical, early surgical intervention? Well, in, in lung cancer, clearly um, prevention is number one, um, and number two is early intervention if you can't prevent. Um, obviously, screening will help us with um, early intervention. Um, adjuvant therapy that Lynn alluded to, which is giving additional treatment either at the beginning before you operate on someone or after you've operated on someone, has really been the standard um, for lung cancer probably for about the past six or seven years. Um, in intermediate stages. Still, the early stage patients are, are best treated um, with uh, local therapies alone, such as surgery or stereotactic radiotherapy without um, chemotherapy. I'd also add that um, one of the things that we've done, which has kind of set us up for the future to really be a leader in this area, is to start thinking about and talking about what's called reflex molecular testing. When I take something out of a person now, a lobe of their lung or a, a small piece of their lung with a tuber con tumor contained within it, after a couple days I produce a pathology report and oftentimes I'll sit down and go over it with the family and the patient. And that really describes everything we've done, um, but it's descriptive. It's what it looks like under a light microscope. Um, more recently, we've started to, to reflexively test out for certain molecular markers. 
Right now we're doing it for a small number. They're very well markers that are very well described in lung cancers. And we've selected for our first panel of markers those in which we have a molecule or a treatment um, which will, tr will change. So for example, there's a, a marker called EGFR for which we have an oral drug you can take. Um, so if you have that mutation in your genome, we can give you that drug. Um, there's another mutation called KRAS, which we actually don't have a targeted therapy for at the moment. Um, however, um, it does predict what your survival will be in, in lung cancer, so we test your uh, tumor for that. There's some new things coming down the road, and it's interesting. You talked a little bit about whether it's one disease or another. You start to see some overlaps. Um, for example, her, her, her new is a very important gene in breast cancer. Um, and actually, the people that treat breast cancers have a drug to treat it. It's called Herceptin. Um, but it turns out as we kind of study more and more tumors, we find that there are some lung cancers that express that particular abnormality. There are some esophageal cancers which express that. So as we go further along, we kind of find this convergence of kind of etiology. The underlying things that have probably caused these tumors are starting to converge. Um, and one of the things that has been most rewarding is I work with some people at the Wistar Institute, which is right across the street. Um, and in conjunction with the Cancer Center, we share specimens that we take out that aren't used for diagnostic purposes. And one of the labs over there is actually trying to isolate some of the stem cells from the, the tumors that we take out, really to try to look at what's that progenitor cell, what actually started. Um, and the hope and the possibility might be that a lot of them have the same progenitor cell, and if you could figure that out, maybe you could figure out a treatment that could, could target a, a broader range of cancers. Great. Thank you. Steve, a um, couple of questions about prostate cancer, and it seems like a many different approaches that a patient can get this, have the same condition, but say they should get radiation therapy or surgery or hormonal therapy. Can you help Tell us how, I mean, how are decisions made about the optimal therapy for prostate cancer? It's tough. tough this is decision. a tough situation, and uh, really the power here is in uh, understanding um, about the disease and asking lots of questions of the doctors uh, and other providers that, that a prostate cancer uh, patient sees. And so for early stage prostate cancer, um, we split those patients up into three categories, and, and they're low risk patients, intermediate risk patients, and high risk patients. And so when you, you hear me say that, you begin to understand that we're sort of categorizing patients in smaller and smaller groups. And there's a different treatment approach for each of those groups of patients. The vast majority of men who have prostate cancer have early stage cancer that's either low risk or intermediate risk, and it's that low-risk group of patients who have a significant number of options. So that would be surgical procedures, and the surgical procedures could be the open removal of the prostate, or it could be a robotic removal of the prostate. There's radiation therapy, and there's about five different types of radiation therapy that can be given for a prostate cancer patient. And you hear CyberKnife, you hear about seeds called brachytherapy, you hear about IMRT, you hear about proton therapy. Um, and then there's something that we call active surveillance, which means that we don't necessarily treat that patient with prostate cancer, and we actually follow that patient um, and follow the uh, blood test with the PSA, and we follow an MRI, and we do routine biopsies. So um, it's a very complicated area. There are a lot of different formulas that are available in the literature that help us to guide patients what's the best option for you. And for early stage prostate cancer, when the decision comes down between surgery and radiation, often that's a choice that a man can make uh, based upon some convenience factors, and that is the side effects that might be expected from that treatment, whether they want it to be one treatment or multiple treatments, uh, whether they want an operation or not. And so um, th these are the issues that sort of face men when they have it. I think that the most difficult decision for prostate cancer patients is this issue of active surveillance. Do I actually need my prostate cancer treated? Um, and that's a really difficult decision to have because most people, when they're diagnosed with a cancer, are, it's hard for them to fathom that they might not need treatment for that cancer. And a lot of people sit around thinking, as time goes on, I've got this cancer inside me. It's like this clock that's ticking, and eventually something bad could happen. So what we don't know, but what data are emerging, is that we're trying to figure out which of those patients we can predict based upon some very... Um, sophisticated genetic and blood marker tests, which of those patients actually have a high risk 
of having cells spread elsewhere and actually need to be treated versus those patients who have a relatively low risk um, and can be watched for a period of time. And we have some data now that guide us, but we're getting more and more data with respect to that. So my response to you is that every patient is an individual. We have to take everybody's case individually. We have to put all the data together. Um, it's very important to understand the risks and benefits of each treatment. It's also understand, important to understand the limitations of those treatments um, and to see a qualified person and to ask those questions. So when you come to Penn Medicine, you'll actually see a urologist and a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist, and you can ask all of those doctors their opinion, and then we get together and we actually talk about those things. And I think it's that setting that allows us to give the most informed decision to patients, because the, the decisions are complicated. Well, and I just understood that Alan Wien is here, a urologist. Alan, are you here? Do you want to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> but this is great. We could have a whole debate on radiation oncology and urology, but in fact, it works. I was telling the truth, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. How'd I do, anything, Alan? Any, anything to add, Alan? No, I think that what Steve said is correct. I mean, we try and really present a multidisciplinary front to the patient and to give them and their family, because the family is a big factor in making the decision, enough information about advantages and disadvantages of active surveillance, which we're using more and more, about surgery, the different types, and about radiation therapy, so that in the final analysis, it's the patient's decision and the family. And we're always available for telephone calls, for talks, for follow-up, and if something doesn't go quite according to plan and the treatment fails, we're always available to treat the failures as well. Because failure of the first treatment or strategy certainly doesn't mean that the game's lost in prostate cancer. There are plenty of other remedies available. Great, thank you. Steve, there's a question about nanotechnology. Can you tell us what nanotechnology is and how does that apply to treatment or diagnosis? So the um, ideal vision of cancer medicine in, in this century is to eradicate the tumor and leave the patient whole and intact. And what you've heard from the, all the panelists is well, we all have different approaches. There's immunotherapy approaches, surgical approaches, radiation approaches. And emerging technology is, is nanotechnology, tiny particles that can encapsulate an antibody, a, uh, a, a good molecule which can kill this uh, tumor. And, uh, especially in neurosurgery, that's very exciting because one of the problems has been drug delivery and the blood-brain barrier. And what we have now are biodegradable polymers which are inserted at the time of surgery. But in the laboratory, theoretically, we could encapsulate an antibody or a molecule and deliver it to the target or stem cells that would hone in on the tumor and uh, thereby kill the tumor and eradicate it, leaving the patient intact. Do we have time to do one quick and where, how much time? We good? Two more? Okay. We're good? <clears throat> Can I, Steve, I, could you, there was a question about what are the um, concerns about doing scans in patients, the radiation associated with doing CT scans and MRIs, a lot of concern about this. Yep. So that is a really good question, um, and it's all about risk and benefit. So the first thing I want to say is that um, we're always looking at new imaging modalities um, and potentially using non-ionizing radiation, so not the typical x-rays that you, you get with a chest x-ray or a CT scan. So we're looking at new modalities to reduce that risk. So the big concern about um, x-rays um, is their uh, potential for causing cancer. and so. The, and it's certainly true that the greater your exposure, the, the longer your exposure, the more times you have exposure to radiation, the increase the risks of getting a cancer related to radiation exposure. Now, it's, the risk is actually very, very small. So um, the, the job of a doctor communicating this, this issue with respect to scans is to communicate that risk versus benefit. Um, and it's also important to understand that, for example, the amount of dose you would get from a chest X-ray is not dissimilar to the amount of radiation dose that you get from cosmic X-rays taking a cross-country trip. 
So we always try to put this in perspective. But the overall principle is, it's called ALARA, as low as reasonably possible, meaning that we want to make sure that we judiciously use these scans. So we ask ourselves the question, what's the risk associated with getting a CAT scan versus the risk of under-detecting something, whether that's screening for lung cancer or that is missing a recurrence that we could potentially treat. Um, and there are a fair amount of studies that look at this um, and guide us with respect to that information. So, um, for example, the, the, the CAT scan studies that John said in terms of screening for lung cancer, they use low dose CT scans. And of course, the lower the dose, the lower the chance of getting uh, a complication like a second cancer from it. So I think the guidance is that we need to do both things. We need to avoid uh, x-rays if possible. But on the other hand, they are useful and they do help us do really important things in terms of the surveillance of cancer and the early detection of cancer. That coupled with research that allow us to look at non-X-ray ways of imaging patients, I think is the way that we'll go in the future. Great, thank you. I see Jason in the audience. <clears throat> Can I pose a question to you? Sure. There's a lot of question about, Jason Newman is a head and neck cancer surgeon, and my question to you is, there's a lot of uh, recommendation to get the HPV vaccine. I wonder if you could help put that, I mean, is this a fair question to ask you, the role of what do you think the impact is of HPV vaccination, and could you comment on that for us? Sure. So uh, I can comment on it as it, pro as it relates to head and neck cancer specifically, because there's clearly a lot of issues as HPV relates to a lot of different diseases. But when it comes to head and neck cancer, just to give you some background, uh, we are seeing an alarmingly high rate of HPV-related head and neck tumors. So classically, the patients who had head and neck cancer were people who were smokers, drinkers, usually in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and we're starting to see a very significant change in that demographic. There's probably, we're starting to see kind of a bimodal distribution. We're seeing a group of relatively young patients, often in their 30s and 40s, and then still this group of people who are, uh, have different risk factors, but the cause seems to be HPV, the <coughs> cause of things like cervical cancer. So we're seeing this in tonsil cancers, basal tongue cancers, and other throat cancers. And the question comes up quite often, in fact, in our discussions is, is there a role for the vaccine? And frankly, right now, we still don't quite know the answer to that, because the reality is that most of the patients that we're seeing have clearly been exposed to this virus. So at this point, it's unclear if the vaccine will help boost their immune system's ability to help manage it, although that's even um, coming up in trial to see if that even getting the vaccine, once you've been exposed, may help. But in terms of what we expect in the next generation, I, I think we'll probably see a, that this that bimodal distribution hopefully will go back down as we're seeing less <laughs> exposure to the, uh, to the uh, uh, antigen in, in patients. So I think it will help. Great. It's a long <clears throat> Great, thank you. Do we have time for one more? One more? So Bob, I'm going to ask you this. Two, two quick, if you could answer. They're huge questions, but short okay, answers. So okay, so two words. Why is it taking so long for immunotherapy to get going here? And as discover, this is not just immunotherapy, but as discoveries are made, how do you think a pharmaceutical companies, so industry, academic partnership should work to advance science and new discoveries? So why is it taking so long? You know. Um, the director of the NCI was asked that question by uh, um, Jerry Groupman, who writes for The New Yorker, a physician himself. So I'll just say what Harold Varma says, which is, which is you know, it's a pretty good answer. He said, uh, 10 years ago, we, we didn't know what we were doing. And what he means by that is that the science had not matured. We didn't understand the immune system. We didn't understand how it interacted with cancer. And it's completely different now, exponentially more new knowledge. And the kinds of therapies being brought forward now are all the best, uh, take all the best of cell biology, molecular biology, uh, protein chemistry. And so I, I think that's why we see a, a new age. I think we understand that we can't go forward in making new therapies, particularly these types of therapies, without some interaction and some collaboration with industry. Uh, industry does uh, things extremely well in certain areas, and, and, and developing drugs is one of them. Uh, and, and, and doing the, the nuts and bolts of refining a prototype into a, into a candidate um, drug that can go forward. I think our attitude at Penn Medicine and the Cancer Center is that we do want a partnership with industry, large pharma, small biotechs, because we're all ultimately 
have our eye on the same ball, which is to improve the health of our patients. And we all agree on that when we get together, and I think we're seeing a new age of that as well, where we need each other um, to help our patients ultimately. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the audience for fantastic and provocative questions and our panel. Um, that was very great. And I'll welcome back Chi Dang as we move forward on our program. Thanks. Great. First of all, I want to thank our panel. For well, thank you. Um, just a couple of observations from uh, listening to the panels. First of all, from what Lynn said about uh, sun worshiping, I'm a believer that uh, Californians are addicted. Um, <laughs> so addic ad addiction to sunlight. Um, but what you've heard here today is that cancer is a whole series of complex diseases. And you heard a little bit about uh, the make of cancer cells where we now know that there are many different accelerators and brakes that controls cell growth in normal cells. And these are broken in cancer cells. So all these mutations you hear about, are, we now can actually sequence through the cancer genome and find all these mutations. And we now have some smart drugs to go after some of these mutations. But if their cancer is limited, you can go after the cancer through either surgery or, or, or radiation. If it's already escaped, you heard about new approaches to, to immunotherapy that seeks out and kill up the cancer cells. Oh, we use new drugs. These are car targeted therapy you heard from uh, about lung cancer, where you have certain mutations where you use drugs. In fact, one of the mutations that's found in lung cancer is also found in neuroblastoma, for example. So there are certain mutations that we call drivers. They drive the cancers. And the same drug can be used in lung cancer in neuroblastoma in children. So there are certain you know, areas that have really been developed. So it's clearly going to take a whole village to really take care of this uh, whole group of devastating disease. And the village at uh, Penn Medicine is uh, the Emerson Cancer Center. And we're, we're looking forward to assembling teams to take care of patients that you've heard about already. So I'm very excited to look forward to this, and we want to make sure we get there to the point where we actually say that we can provide accurate, individualized medicine using the latest science and also with great uh, uh, full compassion from the patient perspective. And your support, of course, is uh, critically important for us to get there, so remember that. And now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Jean Stern, who is co-chair of the Young Friends of the Abramson Cancer Center to uh, present our inaugural uh, Young Friends of the Gameson Cancer Center Award. Now, Jen represents the third generation of women in her family who have advocated for the Abramson Cancer Center. Her grandmother, Irma Barnes, generously established a fund to support cancer research, and her mother, Linda, served as the first chair of our Abramson Cancer Center Director's Leadership Council. Now, Jen and her husband, Dan Stern, leading and maturing the Young Friends Group, which is a group dedicated to uh, generate vital funds to support our young investigators. Um, and without their funding, um, as you know, many of their young investigators with great ideas would not be able to push this forward to make an impact. So we're very grateful uh, for uh, Jen's effort. And um, in light of the diminishing uh, funding from NIH and, and NCI. This is a critically important activity, and so I applaud her for that. And um, I want to thank uh, Jen and Dan for your role in helping uh, our faculty to innovate and bring new hope to, uh, to, uh, to our patients. So I'm going to have Jen uh, come up to present the award. Thank you, Chi. I am so pleased to be here tonight to present this award. As Chi mentioned, my family is no stranger to the Abramson Cancer Center, and I wanted to continue the tradition of advocating on behalf of this wonderful Philadelphia institution. I was introduced to the Abramson Cancer Center through Dr. John Glick over 20 years ago, when my grandfather was first diagnosed with cancer. The work that the Cancer Center was doing became extremely important to my family and me, and we have been involved ever since. Tara Gongadar is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology. She is a new member of the Abramson Cancer Center family, having moved to Philadelphia from Chicago where she completed fellowships in hematology oncology and in clinical pharmacology and pharmacogenomics at the University of Chicago Medical Center. She is a graduate of the New York University School of Medicine. 
Tara hopes to expand and enhance clinical care and clinical research in the area of melanoma and other solid malignancies. And because of the steady rise in melanoma in young women, perhaps as a result of tanning beds, we thought Tara would be a great match for this award. Tara, on behalf of all of the Young Friends of the Abramson Cancer Center, we are pleased to present you with the inaugural Young Friends of the Abramson Cancer Center Award for your commitment to ensuring the cancer ends with our generation. Thanks to everyone for attending tonight, and if you would like to get more involved with the Young Friends group or know someone who might, I would be happy to talk about my experience and connect you with the group. Let me just, uh, and uh, I'm Ralph Muller, the CEO of the Health System, and it's, uh, I think it's an extraordinary evening. So my thanks to uh, my colleagues, Dr. Jameson, Dr. Dang, Dr. Vandehei, Dr. Kartik, Dr. Han, Dr. Brem, and Dr. Shakta. I think you can see the extraordinary talent uh, we, we have here. Let me just take a few of the themes and summarize them uh, for you. I think you heard them very well uh, tonight. One is that how much science and patient care feed each other. Uh, you know, some of the models, maybe 23, 30 years ago is that uh, the science then leads to discovery in the patient care arena. But I think what you're hearing tonight is as our doctors and nurses see patients, it gives them new ideas, new ways of treatment, and that kind of interaction between care and science constantly advance each other. A second theme you heard tonight, you heard the word teamwork constantly, how these people work uh, uh, together. And I think we've made major investments in teams. We made, made major investments in technology, such as the ones that uh, um, uh, we have the Abramson Cancer Center and the Roberts Proton Therapy Center. And we invest in programs, increasingly, how to bring all this together, people, technologies, how this kind of battle on cancer, this war on cancer that was announced 40 years ago, is going to keep uh, advancing. It, it's, cancer is very complex, and the kind of people and the kind of technology that we need to fight cancer is very complex as well. And we're just extraordinarily proud of what we do. You've also heard from a whole number of our panelists tonight, we constantly have to keep evaluating what we do. That's how the science keeps moving uh, forward. Dr. Hahn pointed out how all the people in proton therapy, trial, uh, proton therapy care have been put into, um, into trials. And this is what makes the Davidson Cancer Center and the rest of what Penn Medicine does so extraordinary, this kind of commitment to constant evaluation, constant correction, whether what Dr. Ween said when he was asked to comment from the floor, and others, that, that's part of what makes Penn Medicine move forth. And I think a fourth theme you heard tonight is how accessible one has to be. The, the doctors who are here tonight are very accessible to you and our facilities, whether it's the Abramson Cancer Center downtown or our facility three miles away at, at Radnor or out in Valley Forge or Penn Presbyterian Hospital, at Pennsylvania Hospital and 100 sites around the metropolitan area. Our people are accessible, our facilities are accessible. So please come uh, see us in those settings. So I want to sum up by saying, you know, uh, you know, unlike Blanche de Bois in the play Streetcar Named Desire, who depend on the kindness of strangers, we depend on the kindness of friends. So uh, keep giving us the help that you've given us over the, the years, uh, and uh, we, we thank you for coming out uh, tonight. There's a reception to follow in the Sun Lounge, and I want to thank our panelists once more. So please thank them as well, and thank you for coming out. Thank you.